Sunday we began our new study in the Gospel of John. How many of you were here? For part one. All right. I mentioned that John was uh, one of twelve disciples, but John, along with Peter and James, his two brothers, they formed an inner circle around Jesus, which was sort of a backstage pass to the life and ministry of Jesus. And Jesus purposely left John. That close to him, knowing that John would later write an intimate account of the life and ministry of Jesus. So in effect, the Gospel of John is the closest look into the life and ministry of Jesus out of the four accounts that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want to recap last Sunday's look at the first 18 verses of chapter 1. John opened with the same three words that Genesis opens with in the beginning. Genesis says, in the beginning, God. John opens his up with, in the beginning, Jesus. In, in Genesis, we see that God entered a dark universe and he spoke, let there be light. Yet that light that appeared when God spoke didn't appear to be the sun or the moon or the stars because they're not created until the fourth day. So what was the light that was so desperately needed in the darkness? I share that it's my belief that the light that was spoken of was most probably Jesus. The darkness needs Jesus. And remember, the Bible closes with the scene in heaven where the sun is obsolete. Remember that? It says there's no need for, for the sun. And that's because the Heavenly Father and Jesus are equally lighting up the place. Just with their presence. And it says there will be no more night there. It's kind of like Alaska in the summer, I guess. <laughs> Anybody ever been up there? Yeah? During the summer, you know, 23 and a half hour day, something like that, or I don't think it ever really fully gets dark, right? Maybe you see a little sliver of the sun, depending where you, where you are. One day I want to experience that. Or I'll just wait till heaven. I guess that means we don't need to sleep. That's very interesting. Imagine that. Well, your body's never going to need to rejuvenate, get refreshed when we're on the other side of heaven. That's amazing. John says then uh, that Jesus, who was that first light of creation, entered the spiritually dark world to help us see our way through this life and into the life to come. And we're also introduced to John the Baptist, a man who was much more popular than John, the writer of the Gospel of John. Uh, I've said somewhere in the past that John the Baptist was the Billy Graham of his day. Yeah. I mean, he was a household name. You know that? John the Baptist was a household name back then. And he drew large crowds. And we're told that even King Herod traveled out into the country to hear him preach because Man, he was just somebody who could preach some barn burners. Herod liked to hear it, even if he was convicted. I'm sure he was. It was good pain or something. But it brought a lot of interest. And during the time John the Disciple was writing this account, there were people who thought that John the Baptist was the Messiah, the long prophesied, awaited Messiah of the Jews. So John cleared up that misnomer by telling the readers that John was simply sent ahead of Jesus with a special privilege of introducing Jesus to the nation of Israel. And this morning, we're going to hear more about whom the John, who John the Baptist was and who Jesus was from John the Baptist himself. So if you haven't already opened in your Bibles to John, chapter 1, verse 19 is where we pick up. Where John, the writer of the Gospel, writes this. This is the testimony or the statement given by John the Baptist when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He stated, 
I'm not the Messiah. So the Jews referred to here in verse 9, they are the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> Call it the Jewish Congress. <clears throat> and for anybody who does not know who, who they are, I'll briefly tell you about them. The Sanhedrin was divided into two groups, made up out of the Sadducees, called them liberals, and the Pharisees called them the conservatives. And it was their duty to examine anybody who was labeled as or claimed to be a prophet or some spiritual leader. Now, I want you to keep in mind that these people of the first century were waiting for the Messiah that was promised by the Old Testament prophets. And the Jews, they are all under Roman occupation at this time, and any captive people, you know, they wait for their deliverer. So they actually wanted the Messiah to come. So it made sense to ask John who he was. So the Jewish Vatican, they sent these priests and these Levites to do the asking. The priests and the Levites, they were theologically educated, they were religiously meticulous. <coughs> and these are the ones that would be able to identify a fake from the real thing, supposedly. I want you to notice that John didn't give him a chance to specifically ask if he was the Messiah. John knew what they were looking for, so he cuts them off and he simply answers, I'm not the Messiah, because I know that's what you're going to ask me now. <clears throat> Verse 21, and they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. First thing they asked, if, if he was Elijah, and it was Jewish belief that the prophet Elijah, who lived centuries earlier, would somehow return to announce the arrival of the Messiah. The oral tradition of the Jews held that Elijah was to come settle all his feet. He'd bring broken families back together. It was even believed that Elijah would anoint the Messiah to his kingly office on earth. Because prophets, that's what they did in the Old Testament. They're the ones that anointed kings. And in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5, it describes this somewhat. But when Malachi says to look for Elijah, he's simply giving a picture of what to look for, which is a man who will have a ministry similar to Elijah, which was a ministry to call people to get serious about God and to clean up their lives as they're doing. Then they asked him this, you know, are you a prophet? Are you the prophet? Well, back in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 15, Moses said that a prophet like himself would come someday in the future. And that was a promise that no Jew ever forgot. Verse 22, then they said to him, well, who are you? you got to give us something. Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Take that to mean you got to give us something to report back to our superiors. Because you clearly have the power to draw people. And your, your message is messianic. I mean, it's good stuff. You're just kind of not normal. <laughs> So John the Baptist gave him something. Verse 23, he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. So John the writer helps the readers connect the dots when he adds these last words of this verse, as the prophet Isaiah said. And the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, he spoke those words. I'm the voice crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. They were words about something he saw in the future before the arrival of the Messiah. That's in chapter 40, verse 3 of Isaiah. He saw somebody outside the city crying out this certain phrase, which was, make straight the way of the Lord. And you see, in Isaiah's day, there were few roads. There were no Roman roads yet. And when a king traveled those roads, which were usually unkept, they were smooth. They were straight now to the royal chariot, which didn't come out with the four-wheel drive package yet. <laughs> Could travel over something smooth. So Isaiah was saying that before the king of kings would make his way to us, there would be a voice in place of shovels and picks that would call people to soften their hearts, make themselves ready <clears throat> for him. John the Baptist knew that he was fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. Isn't that amazing? 
Think that for a moment. If you were John the Baptist and you realized, what? Well, that's my job. I'm the one that was prophesied about centuries earlier. So John the Baptist, he used the words of somebody else to describe himself. Did you notice that? And that's just like John the Baptist. Listen, most of us do not know how popular John the Baptist was because of how well John the Baptist did what God called him to do, which was to point to somebody else. Did you hear that? Yeah. You and I really don't know how popular John the Baptist was because he was really good at doing what God called him to do, which was not to point to himself, but to point to somebody else, Jesus in particular. He described himself just as a voice. And isn't that what we're called to be? A voice, not a personality, not a celebrity, but all too often we are better at announcing ourselves than the Lord. You know, perhaps we haven't settled our own self-esteem issues. We don't really know why and what we are doing as Christians. But here it is, our job is to point people to Jesus. Verse 24, now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Well, the Pharisees believed that they alone had the right to authorize preachers or religious leaders. They, along with the Sadducees, are not found in the Old Testament, by the way. They just appear out of thin air between the 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew, I like to think of it this way, that um, men try to speak when they don't hear God speaking. So it's their attempt to speak on God's behalf, to pad things, to add things. And so here is this uh, man-made religious department of Jewish government that somehow weasels its way into becoming the spiritual authority over the God-ordained religious authority, the priests and the Levites. And they're ordering the priests and the Levites around. But John knew that his authorization came from God and didn't need to come from these guys. And baptizing was something that only authorized people did. And so they're grilling him about his credentials the same way that, you know, a new face in the ministerial community would be grilled by the veterans who've been there first. What seminary did you graduate from? What church ordained you? What are your credentials? But baptizing, that, that wasn't for Jews anyway. Any baptizing that ever took place by a Jewish leader, that was to be done for recent converts from other faiths. The Jews didn't need to be washed, they thought, because they belonged to God already. But the Gentiles, from heathen faiths, needed to be washed. So John was making the Jews do what only Gentiles had to do. He was saying that the chosen people of God needed to be clean as much as any Gentile, because the king is coming. It's about time, everybody. And this is how John answers their question. Verse 26, John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who's coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. Untying the thong of a sandal was the job of a slave. John couldn't have given himself a lower office, a more menial description. He says, I'm not worthy to untie the shoelaces of the man you're about to meet. That probably piqued their interest. Verse 28. A little side note, this took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Bethany. If you're familiar with the Bible, you're familiar with that term. Who lived in Bethany? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Jesus' buddies. And when Lazarus died, Jesus went to Bethany and raised him right there. To life, out of that grave in Bethany. <clears throat> and then it appears that right before Jesus left, and you read about this in the beginning of Acts, before he left earth, I mean, he gathered all of his disciples, they went to Bethany. And I think that appears up where he ascended back to be with his heavenly father from Bethany. Mm -hmm. It's 
special place. Verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, this is the moment John the Baptist has been waiting for his entire life. His life was completely dedicated to prepare the Jews for this very moment. When after centuries upon centuries of waiting, the Messiah would finally appear. Wow. And John had the honor to introduce him. Now listen, I, I've had the honor to introduce some very well-known people over the years. But imagine being the person to introduce you. And no, right? And John doesn't say, here is the Prince of Peace. Or here is the creator of the universe. Drum roll, please. He doesn't say, here is the Son of God. All of which would have been true, appropriate introduction. But that's not what John pointed out to the crowd, did he? Think about that. He introduces Jesus as the Lamb of God. Here's the man born to die for you. Let's hear it for him. And I don't know if they were crying. Yeah, I bet you really wonder. I think, you know, what are the Jews doing? Well, John says that. I mean, you're supposed to say, here's the Messiah. Here's the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. John the Baptist. He was the son of a priest. Remember that when he was born? His daddy couldn't talk for a little while. Right? Zechariah and his mom Elizabeth. And every evening, and every morning, the life of a lamb was to be sacrificed in the temple for the sins of the people. And those sacrificed lambs were what Israel used to get God to accept them on the basis that the punishment for their sins was covered by the death of an innocent substitute. But those were never enough to cover all of their sins, which is why no one just covered recent sins. You gotta keep killing them. You gotta keep killing them. Kill another lamb, you know. I lived another five minutes. I must have sinned. Kill another one. Now listen, if you had to kill a sam uh, lamb after it tended to sin, how many would you kill today? Some of you with less than others. Uh, think about that. So they're constantly killing these lambs. There's a bloodbath. The sacrifices were never enough. However, Jesus' death once could cover all sins. And according to Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 7, at one point in Jesus' ministry, he quoted Psalm 40. And it infers that the following Old Testament quote were prophecies for him to fulfill. And he quotes from the Psalms. He says, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, the Heavenly Father, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. For those who don't understand the image of Jesus as the Lamb of God, I want to help you understand it right now. It's a, it's a thread that runs through the scriptures. Ready? I, I think it's the, to me, it's the greatest thread that runs through the Bible beginning to end. And I'm just going to give you a handful of the scriptures that are part of the thread. Ready? The very first Lamb that was sacrificed, the first acceptable offering to God is what it was, and it's in Genesis, the very beginning. Remember this? Who sacrificed it? Abel. We read that's the first acceptable sacrifice to God. To atone for, for sin is a lamb that Abel offers. Further down the road, Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, Abraham is about to sacrifice his son Isaac to God, because God told him to. And then God stops him in the nick of time and goes, okay, I see that you love me more than your son. You're willing to give him to me because I ask you to. And God swaps out that boy for a, a ram, a male lamb. 
that just before God sends the angel of death, the final plague upon Pharaoh and all of Egypt, God tells his people to take a male lamb that is without blemish, blemish, no deformities, no odd spots, and kill it, paint its blood over the front door of your house, and the angel of death will then pass over your house and over your family. One lamb per household should do the trick. And the emphasis is on the blood of the lamb. Yeah. When you read that. There is safety in the blood of a lamb without blemish. Isaiah 53. Isaiah sees the future. He sees a man being killed like a lamb when it's being slaughtered. And he's going to protect others from having to endure God's wrath. And the need for the lamb now becomes the need for a person. In John chapter 1, verse 29, right here. You read it from John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is now identified as that Lamb that Isaiah saw. 1 Peter 1, Jesus is written, described as a risen Lamb, destined before the foundation of the world without blemish. Oh, so this whole thing about the Lamb... And Jesus being the Lamb of God, that wasn't a new thing. That wasn't kind of made up as we go. That was God's idea before he even made the world. Because he knew where this thing was going. And he made it anyway. Aren't you glad he made you anyway? <laughs> Aren't you glad you have the relationships you have anyway? Aren't you glad you're alive anyway? Yeah. Now I know for some people, relatively few... They don't think life is worth living. That is not what God wanted. He clearly thought, despite everything that can come with a fallen world and you being fallen people, you need to be alive anyway. You're going to love it. He wants you to. He wants you to know Him, that He would take you through this life. And then what we see in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, as the Bible's getting wrapped up, there's this multitude of people from every tribe, every nation, every language, singing before a person this. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. He's alive because he's the only Lamb that came back from the dead. That lamb died like all lambs that were sacrificed for sin, but he was the only one to come back to life. So listen, when we introduce Jesus to people, what do we most often introduce him as? Oh, he's my friend. He's my Savior, he's my Lord. He's my helper. How about he is the lamb? Why don't we use what John uses? Maybe that's a way to start. I mean, I want to introduce you to Jesus. I want you to get to know the one who's a friend, he's a helper, but he is that because he was first my substitute. He's my lamb. John the Baptist's ministry was all about getting people ready for the work of Jesus, helping people see their condition and need for a Savior, and then helping them see who the Savior was. John the Baptist was called John the Baptist because he was baptizing people, giving people an experience, an outward sign, because that's all it is. In case anybody is confused here, baptism does not earn you brownie points with God. It does not get you into heaven. It actually, it doesn't take your sins away. Do we know this? It is a sign only. It is a sign, an outward sign of what has taken place or is taking place in your life. You got cleaned up, get cleaned up by God. So John's ministry was helping people see their need of a Savior, specifically the Lamb of God. You know, there's nothing like pointing out somebody's sins and a need for a solution. may not make you a bunch of friends. You know what's interesting? 
when you do bring up our fallen nature, and there's this thing that just makes us keep getting in the same old ruts and we keep making bad decisions, every human being you share that with will totally understand. They might even listen up to you because you're actually speaking something about something they totally identify with. Oh yeah, I keep making the same bad choices. Or I oh yeah. They, they, they can agree. We got, we got something faulty in our heart and our mind, our reasoning, our, our compass, our moral compass. We got something wrong. It's okay to go there with people. You might even pique their interest more than saying, oh, Jesus, let me introduce you to him because he's my friend. Everybody should have friends. Most people you talk to when you say something like that, well, hmm, he's just an error. I don't need an invisible friend to thank you. <laughs> Meet them where their need is. Because actually they're aware of it. However much they try to tune it out, they know something's missing. And when the timing was right, and the people were still coming back to the Jordan day after day, still dirty, because they realized that baptism of John, it didn't have any magic powers. Ah, I still sinned yesterday. Even after getting baptized, I'm going to come back out and try to do it again. <laughs> See if maybe that'll do it. That's what Jesus is introduced, and John says he takes it from here. Speaking of getting baptized, who needs to get baptized? If anybody has not been baptized, I would like to try to do that this Saturday at our church anniversary, right out there in our little lake. But first, I've got to, like, Brush off some slippery <laughs> algae. <laughs> and I'll see, I'll test it out and I'll see if it works. <clears throat> but if anybody's not been baptized, you want to give it a shot out there, talk to me at the end of the service. Okay? Let's see what we can do. It'll be very fun. The jacuzzis are more comfortable. <laughs> if anybody has a little bit baptized people in there too. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? <clears throat> Spirit of God, would you help us help people see? Specifically, that it is Jesus who they need. Would you prompt us to put in a good word for him this week? To look for an opening, make an opening, and talk about just life as it is, and see who would respond begin the dialogue about the Lamb of God. And we thank you for him. And if there's anybody in this room this morning that does not know if you're a Christian yet, if, if you don't know, if, you're, if you can say, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian, then you probably are. And you can become one, a follower of Jesus. You just start today by telling him right now, Jesus, I'm going to believe what I heard. I'm going to step out on this for the first time and believe that you, you took upon yourself what I have coming. And I want you then to lead me in knowing about you. And reveal yourself to me as I'm supposed to know you. If anybody prayed that right there with me, don't leave this place without letting me know this morning.
you get baptized.